this is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. In this episode, I talk with bass player, composer, music educator, and recipient of five Grammy Awards, Victor Wooten. I talk with him about how you communicate through a musical instrument, how you communicate through the bass specifically. And he also gives us advice on, for those people who have had a bad experience maybe in learning music as they were kind of growing up, and how to get back to playing music and enjoying the fun that you can have from learning and playing music. He also talks about his nature music camps, which are really, really cool. So please enjoy the show. Hey, it's James Taylor, and I'm excited to bring you our featured guest today. It is Victor Wooten. Victor is a bass player, composer, author, producer, and music educator, and a recipient of five Grammy Awards. He has won Bass Player of the Year from Bass Player Magazine three times in a row, and Rolling Stone named him as one of the top ten bass players of all time. His book, The Music Lesson, A Spiritual Search for Growth Through Music, was met with rave reviews, and he is currently working on the sequel. Since 2000, his innovative music camps, which are held at Wooten Woods, 147-acre riverfront property in Tennessee, have taught a unique combination of music and nature studies. And Victor, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here. So share with our listeners what's going on in your world just now. Well, I'm, I'm lucky that uh, I'm one of the musicians that gets to stay busy. And uh, I've been doing as much teaching now that I, you know, than I have playing, which is great for me. I love it. I'm uh, currently teaching at at Berkeley College of Music in Boston every month now. Um, five days every month I'm there, as well as doing lots of workshop shops, workshops, and teaching at my own camps that I've been doing now. We just finished our sixteenth year. And uh, as well as doing some concerts and things like that. So it's a fun life, wonderful family, and my kids, I'm enjoying myself. Fantastic. So but before we kind of get into um, all the amazing things you, you've done in, the, in your career, let's, let's take our listeners back. How did you first get involved in, in, in learning and playing music? And especially, you know, how did you get involved in playing the bass? And at what point in your life did you say, this is what I want to do? I, I, I want to th- make music my life. Yeah, um, <clears throat> that's an easy one. I, I learned from my brothers. I'm the youngest of five. So I have four older brothers. And um, literally, when I was born, they knew they needed a bass player. <laughs> so you, you, you were tagged for that job already. <laughs> right away. And, and they're not much older than me. My oldest brother out of the five, he's only eight years older than me. So you have to think about it. Literally, when I was born, born he was only eight but they knew who they were and what they were doing already so by the time I was five we were out gigging and doing shows and I've kind of never never not played music and so fortunately for me the bass was what was needed and that's how I came to it and then uh, so kind of growing up in that family where everyone's playing music just such a an integral um integral part of it did you I mean, as a kid growing up did you almost like treat the uh, you had no distinction between a toy that you were picking up and playing and, and having fun with and and a musical instrument did it just did it was it really just the, the same thing to you it was the same thing it was just something that my brothers did and every little sibling wants to be like his older brothers or sisters. Sisters, And it was a way for me to belong, and it was another way of communicating. So I really look at it like, like a language, like talking, because I was literally learning music at the same time I was learning English. And so whenever my brother sat down to play, I would sit down to play. And so it was such a natural part of my upbringing that I never really thought of it as important or 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 separate or anything different than just who I was as a child. 
And obviously now you're mentioning that you, you're teaching at, uh, uh, you teach at Berkeley and um, you obviously have your, your own camps as well. What, what was, how did you actually learn? Was it just by, by ear um, or were, were there teachers and mentors in those early years as you were playing? Yeah, well, you have to think about it. <clears throat> when, or when, let me change that to when you think about it like a language. Uh, it's really easily understood. You know, you learn by ear, but also by doing. Where you're you're learning to talk by talking to people and having people talk to you. But there's a couple of there's a few important qualities that allow us to learn to speak our language very very early. Some of them being that you're never ta- taught what to do or what to say. No one tells you as a baby, here's how to do it. No one even corrects you when you're wrong. You're never made to practice. And you're you're never made to st- only talk to other babies. So you're treated equal to the professionals. You get to jam with the pros when it comes to learning to talk. And when you say things wrong as a baby, no one corrects you. Everyone starts saying it wrong like you because it's cute. (laughs) Yeah. So I learned to play music the same way. No one was correcting me. It wasn't about an instrument. It was about communicating. So I was just strumming a little toy however I wanted, you know, it just so happened to be on beat, but no one was saying, do it this way, put your finger here. It's this scale. When it comes to learning a language, we understand that we learn to talk first, learn the rules later. And I learned to play music that way. And it was, a, in my opinion, the quickest way to do it. And do you remember a time in your life where, you you met people who that wasn't their experience, where they 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 learned in a, in, a, in, a, in a different kind of way, and uh, you know, through through college or through you know other sure. ways of doing it. And what what was your take on that? So you, I mean, you you had a very uh, humanistic, natural way of 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 learning that you talk about, like like learning a, a language. But what was your take when you heard about how other people ha- had had learned their instruments? Yeah. Well, I'm dealing with those people a lot whenever I do my camps or or teach at a a college or a store. I'm dealing with people who, you have to realize not everybody was born into a band the way I am. But everyone was born into a, a speak, a family who spoke a language. And that was the language you spoke first and the easiest. So because I learned... The way I did, I'm able to relate that to other people. And because we all learn to speak the same way, I use speaking as my way of teaching music because everybody understands that. Mm. But in dealing with people, I understand their process because that's the norm. My way is not the norm. My way, I believe, is more natural because it's the norm when we talk about speaking. But when we talk about music, the norm is to go take lessons, get a teacher, practice a lot, learn to play later. And I'm not even calling that wrong. It's just different than how I learned. So my goal is to be able to add in some of my approach to what they do, not always to take the place of what they do, but to give them another way of looking at music. In other words, most people who play music, and I I think, I think it's safe to say most people who play music think that there's a right way to do it. You have to do it this way. And that's the problem is that we're all trying to be right or even more, you know, worse than that, which we're playing music in an attempt not to be wrong. Mm. The whole goal is not to make a mistake because someone might hear it. But when we talk, it's about expressing an idea. And the idea is what our focus is on, getting a message across. So the whole approach is different. So anyone who's learned to play music like I did from a natural environment where people were around you were playing, whether they were relatives, friends, or whatever, people play the same way. You know, you have an idea, you have a feeling, 
you want to get across, whether it's making people dance or just approaching this overall song. And then we all realize that, wow, we can describe this song or talk about this song, you know, any way we choose. You know, if, in the bluegrass world, they're still learning this way, sitting under a tree, learning fiddle tunes from an elder. You know, and nobody has to play it exactly like the elder. You're describing that song however you choose. So having been teaching now for a long time, uh, I'm able to come up with different ways of getting people to understand my approach. But it starts with me first understanding theirs. And I feel like I really do. And what would you say as as a music artist and as a creative person are your your kind of greatest strengths, but also what would you say is, is your, your, your biggest weakness? As a musician? As a musician, teacher? a musician, teacher, or, you know, as a creative person. Well, I, I, those, I think those strengths and, and goals and things change. I know they do for me or they have for me as I've gotten older. My main goal now is to help people uh, reclaim their musical freedom. You know, in other words, like when you sing in the shower, you're not singing to be right. You're not afraid of what other people think. That doesn't even enter your mind. You're just singing because it feels good. And you're almost unconscious, not even thinking about it. Or when you sing driving in the car to work. For me, that's the right way. That's the same as a kid playing air guitar or air drums to the radio. It's not about the instrument. It's about expressing yourself. And there's freedom in that because and in that moment, there's no right or wrong way to do it. That doesn't even come into your mind. You're just doing it. So what I've been looking for are ways of bringing musicians back to that state. Back to that state before you knew anything, when it was just pure fun. And now because you do know something, how can we re-enter that freedom world of of, of fun and smiling. And so I found exercises where uh, my, my exercises that I start with anyway are geared towards showing you what you can already do. And maybe you didn't know it. In other words, you're already able to play great music from the beginning, from day one, we can play great music. And then we'll take all that stuff you do know and, and, and which will cause you to play better. And so I believe as a teacher, those are some of my, some of my strengths. Um, as a musician, my, my goal is to, to make you feel good when I play. I just want you to feel things that make you happy, that make you smile. And rather than you seeing how great I am as a musician, I'd rather you see your potential. I want you to leave my concert wanting to go do something, wanting to go do something that you've always loved to do. Not just say, wow, he's incredible. He's a great musician. I want you to, re to realize your joy, your gifts, even if you have to use me as your example. That sounds kind of egotistical, but... That's what I want. You know, if you can't see it in yourself, then see it in me until you can see it in yourself. And you mentioned this, you know, this kind of reclaiming your your musical freedom, I think, was the, the expression yeah. you used. So I, I was reading a book the other day, I think it was by Hugh McLeod, who was talking about creativity and um, this idea that as kids, you know, we're given, our, we're given crayons and we can lose ourselves for hours and hours in those crayons. And then it gets to a point, usually like around schooling age, where the crayons get, get taken away, away from us. We go into this kind of formal teaching uh, land. And then it was interesting because he was talking about this. Often at points in our lives, um, around big events, so you know, big birthdays, usually birthdays ending with zeros, um, or big life events where you lose someone, a lot of people kind of look to return back to that creative thing. Uh, whether it's music right. or creative writing or what things. So yeah. I suppose the, the, qu the question I had for you then is what can we do in terms of in the, that schooling thing to keep that, that joy in, in, in the making of music? And is there any, 
is there any help, especially you can give you give to or advice you give to people who maybe want to return? They're not musicians, but maybe they get to a a big birthday or something, <coughs> something happens and they want to return back to playing, but they're not quite sure how to get back into it. Sure. Well, w- one of the things that I do with people is have them recognize a place in their life where they've never lost that freedom. And that's in language. You say and you talk in a way that you choose, right? And and just the fact that with, with our language, we've learned to read and write. We've learned nouns and verbs and pronouns. In other words, we've learned, uh, to use English as an analogy, we've learned English theory, music or language theory, a lot of people are afraid of music theory because they think it's going to rob them of their freedom. But, but in language, it's given us more freedom, the fact that we can read and write. And so in looking at that, it helps people change their mind about their fears of learning more theory and things like that. And they realize that, wow, I've talked my whole life. I learned by copying my parents. I've studied. I've learned a lot of theory, and I know my how to read. And I'm still free. So maybe that can happen in music. So that's one way that I that I help people relax and realize that it can be done. One of the other things that I do is um, just give people the freedom to play badly. And let them know, you know what, I'm going to love you no matter how you play like a like a child. You know, you love your children even when they're bad. However you play, let's just play. Let's turn it away from playing these notes and scales right. Let's just turn it into expressing ourselves. For this one lesson or this one song, we're just going to express ourselves, you know, good or badly. And, um, and what ends up happening in allowing people to play badly, they end up playing some of their best music ever because they're free. They're not holding back. And then they found out they find out why wow, I can't even play badly because playing badly for most people just means playing wrong notes. And those wrong what we call wrong notes are beautiful. Using the notes that really aren't in the key are gorgeous. Those are the ones that bring emotion out of people. So in getting people to so-called play their worst, they realize, wow, I actually sound pretty good and I'm you know barely even trying. I can't so basically I, reminding people of what they're already good at, the fact that even a 10-year-old kid has been listening to music for 10 years at least. So that means they're not a beginner. They're a 10-year veteran. So even if they're coming to me to, take, to learn to play the bass, I realize they're only a beginner on the bass. But to music, they're not a beginner. And, and allowing people the freedom to realize that they already – they do know something – you are valid as a musician, even your first time walking in the door. You know, getting them to understand that changes things from, from the very beginning rather than thinking, I'm a very beginner, I know nothing, teach me. It's like, wow, I know a lot. If my favorite song comes on, I already know how to dance, you know? And so starting them from a place that you know something and what you know is worthy and valid, let's use that right now to make good music. And even if they're only playing one note, you know, I can put the rest around them to realize, wow, this what I'm doing is musical. I am musical. You're right. I am musical. And now let's learn more. And you have these different projects on the go. Obviously, you mentioned the, the teaching side that's really important to you now um, and, and but still continue in the touring and the recording. But what is the one thing that you're working on just now that is exciting you the most? Uh, there's a few things. Um, that I'll, I'll just mention quickly. One, I love doing the, the camps that I've been doing for 16 years, and we are undergoing a big renovation, and it's exciting to me. We're bringing in new people to help us run it because basically my wife and I have been running it for 16 years. So we're finally bringing in help. We're putting our board, our, our nonprofit board, and really putting them to use. And there's so many p- people that have attended our camp that really want to help us take the camp to the next level. And we're finally bringing them in. And so the future of the camp looks really, really bright. And I'm excited about that. Um, There's some projects that I've been working on with another friend of mine named Rod Taylor. 
where we use music and and the, the concept of a band or playing together. We use that to show different concepts of life. And we've been doing these programs and keynote speaking and uh, and interactive programs that we've been doing at colleges and different conventions and things like that, where we use music to teach people about working together or diversity or or equality and things like that, where music is a great way to show that. And we're doing more and more of that. And that's a ton of fun, as well as I'm working on a few few more books, including the sequel to The Music Lesson. What, were you surprised by the the level of positive feedback and um, I mean, so I remember when you, your, that first book came out, it was, you get into a bit of a zeitgeist where you hear a book being mentioned or recommended to you multiple times from multiple people coming from multiple <laughs> backgrounds. And it was one of those books. Were you surprised at the, the positive feedback and the, the success? I don't know what in terms of um, uh, commercial success, but in terms of the critical success of it. Totally surprised. I'm still surprised. It's hard now for me to meet a musician who doesn't have something positive to say about the book, and, and I'm thankful for that. I just thought I would be selling the book, you know, at concerts or on my website, um, you know, to anyone interested. But luckily, right in the very beginning, a, a guy who happened to play guitar but also worked for Penguin Books, he found a copy of it and contacted me right away. So the big publisher put it out. And now it's around the world in five different languages. Uh, schools like Berkeley and Stanford and other places are using it and making it mandatory reading. And I'm meeting people literally around the world that have read and not only read but benefited from the book. And a lot of it in a way that that uh, makes me happy, you know, by succeeding at doing exactly what I wanted, which is to bring people their freedom back when it comes to music. Like, wow, I can do this. And so the short answer is yes, I am totally surprised and and gratified. I'm just very happy and thankful for the way it's gone. So obviously that's a, that's a project that was successful. But had, tell me about a time when you worked on something and a project you you gave it your heart and your soul. You gave it all, but for whatever reason, it it, it just didn't work out like you'd hoped. But more importantly, what were the the lessons that you took away from that experience? Well, there, I mean, the only things that really come to mind are a couple of musical opportunities that didn't happen. Lots of those happened with my brothers. You know, ever since we were kids playing in a five piece band, the Wooten Brothers, we were so close to being what you call discovered. You know, starting back to when I was six years old, the first time, great soul singer Curtis Mayfield was going to discover the Wooten Brothers, you know. But it just so happened, uh, you know, we were living in California and for whatever reason, someone came up and said, hey, there's already a, a group of five brothers living in California, <laughs> you know. And so our project, our whole studio recording thing just got canned. It just got canceled. You know, so that was one. And, and you know, there's at least other four other times like that that I could I could talk about um, throughout our career where it was almost supposed to happen. But um, it didn't, you know. And uh, just before I moved to Nashville, you know, I had gotten called by Lee Greenwood. Um, oh, I'm getting a message now from my wife. She's going to pick up our son. Yeah? All right. Cool. Okay. I'll, as soon as I'm done, I'll give you a call. Thank you. So, yeah, this is, this is I'm at home right now. And my wife pretty much runs the household. So she's just passing me a note that she's um, going to pick up pick up our son for gymnastics. Yeah. Um, but um, when uh, be, just before I was moving to Nashville, I uh, you know got a call from a country big time country artist Lee Greenwood. You know he had he had heard about me and heard me. His guitar, his guitars had heard me play, and and at the time I wasn't doing much playing, and our five brothers we weren't playing together much, and that was because of a bad record deal that we had uh, were involved in with a big time producer on Arista Records, finally going to make it, and it fell through, and 
But all of a sudden, I'm going to come to Nashville and play with this country artist. And, you know, and then all of a sudden, I never heard from the country artist again, you know. So, you know, being in being in life in general, things go up and down. That's what makes life what it is. But as a young kid, I learned how to deal with things like that and realize that, you know, those things don't have to stop you. But there's always a, a you know, a jewel or a gem or something that you can learn from it. And I just learned how to keep going. It doesn't mean you don't, don't feel bad about it. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that you have wishes and you wish things had turned out differently. But it does make you stronger and you keep going. And in hindsight, I realize that every situation caused me to be a better person and a better human being. Um, so those are the few things that come to mind. And what about any, in this, this fascinating this journey that you've had in music, any aha ideas or light bulb moments or, or moments of insight where you've you, you said to yourself, okay, uh, Victor, this, this is what I need to be doing. This is a path I need to be going. This is a decision that I, I need to make, and I'm going to make this decision. Can you talk to about any of those aha ideas or light bulb moments in your life? Well, I mean, after the fact of joining Bela Fleck and the Flecktones, great band with... Uh, you know, Howard Levy on harmonica and piano. My brother Roy playing this strange, weird drum set. But Bela Fleck, you know, the mastermind of it all on banjo, incredible musician. I never realized that, you know, my claim to fame in the music world was going to come by playing with a banjo player. <laughs> I thought it was going to be with my four older brothers. Yeah. But looking back on it now, I realize I'm a much better musician because of it. I had never played with anyone except my brothers. And sort of like when you finally get to move out of the house and see the rest of the world, you become a fuller human being. I became a fuller, more complete musician by playing many, many years uh, with other people, um, especially Bela Fleck and the Flecktones. And did when you when Bela asked you about joining the group, um, was there a point where you said you actually thought maybe I'm going to say no to this, this opportunity? Well, yes. Um, but at first, it was supposed to be one show. We got together to do one television show, and then we were supposed to all go our separate ways. Um, and then, you know, a, a year or so later, Baylor said, hey, let's do a little tour. And that tour was supposed to be four shows. And then all of a sudden it's another tour. And all of a sudden now there's a record label and Warner Brothers wants to sign us. And at that point, we're, you know, my brother and I were talking to each other. Wow, this is like a real thing. Do we really want to commit to this? And there were questions to be answered. Fortunately, in the end, we said, yeah, let's do it. And, uh, and it's turned into a good thing. And obviously you're now giving advice to the, the next generation of, of musicians but what's the the best advice that you've ever received in music? Well, the best advice probably came from our parents, and wow, a, a lot of them are rolling through our heads right my head right now. Just think about all the things that my mom and dad would say to us, and uh, one of the things that they taught us was that whether you have a an audition or you're playing a, a basketball game or a football game or whatever, or, or you're looking for a job. She said the only thing you can, the, my mom would say the, the thing that you're in control of is, is whether you're worthy of the job, whether you're worthy of, of uh, getting chosen, whether you're worthy of winning the game or not, um, whether you get the job, whether you're hired, whether you're chosen is not up to you. That's up to someone else. And so it really made us uh, really pay attention to, to, to our ability. Um, another thing that my mom, my mom, I can remember her, her saying to us boys is, it, that's how she exactly say it. She said, the world, what, what does the world need with just another good musician? She says, we have plenty. She says, what the world needs is good people. And so she really had us boys 
pay attention to who we were as people. That was my parents' main concern. Who are you as a person, as a human? And she realized if she could direct us into being good people, that whatever we chose to do, we would be successful at. And with your your uh, music nature camps, we just kind of talk about that because what was what was the the kernel of that idea? Where did that kind of the idea come from, um, and how how has it evolved over time? Sure, uh, it, it came from a few different ideas. It, in the early '90s, I read a book from a nature, uh, a nature man, an author and a and a teacher, a guy by the name of Tom Brown Jr., who still teaches people how to live off the land and a bunch of native philosophies, how to live and how to think. Um, and I read that book and I said, I've got to go study with this man. And when I went and started taking classes with him. I told myself, I said, this guy's teaching music. He calls it nature and awareness and all that, but he's teaching music. And more importantly, this is the way music should be taught. It's not lock yourself in a room and practice. It's let's get out into the world and be more natural. The same way we learn to talk, by talking to people. And so I thought, wow, I want to teach this way. And that was one thing that started me thinking, maybe maybe one day I'll, be, I'll start teaching music. But also a good friend of mine that I met when I moved to Nashville, Tennessee, a guy by the name of Mark O'Connor. Oh, yeah, that's great. Great violinist. Um, in the 90s, and probably still now, he's he was running, um, what he called it, fiddle camps. Fiddle camps, where it just, you know, could be as many as 100 violinists out in a park and a bunch of instructors learning fiddle. And I thought, wow, this is the way I would love a, a, a bass camp to be. And in 2000, all those ideas came together, and I finally ran the first base camp uh, just outside of Nashville, Tennessee. So it was a few ideas and some persistence, some uh, luck, and a lot of guts pulled it all together. Um, interesting, obviously, the, the, the students that are coming there and the, and the families as well, they have this incredible experience. But what's the, what's the first take when you, you know, guys like Chuck Rainey and, and I mean, you've got, had some great teachers there? When they come out for the very first time, and many of these these people have taught at uh, you know the Berkeleys or, or MI or any of these these other music schools in, around the world or, or, or workshops, but what's their take when they come to one of your events as a teacher? It's really nice. I remember Chuck coming to our very first camp, and afterwards he said, "If if you'll have me, I want to be at every one of these." And uh, and he has been even through his stroke, mm. you know, he was able to still make it to a camp. But the cool thing I like about it is that people, even people who are successful in their own right, either either they're out there selling records, touring, or teaching, when they come as a guest to our camp, they really like our approach. They like the setting, and they get a lot out of it themselves. And uh, and they either want to come back. Or, you know, even better yet, you know, start doing things on their own, very similar. So we've been lucky. I'm very lucky to have a lot of great friends who are willing to take the chance and come and teach for us and things like that. And, uh, but, but at, and every time, you know, I think both parties benefit from it. Either they want to donate something to our camp or sometimes they won't even take their pay because, you know, they know that we're working on a shoestring budget. And they want to put their pay back into the, the camp. And we love that. So, you know, we're very thankful for every guest instructor as well as every student that comes. Because we've gotten a lot of help from our students. But um, the camp, what it does, it provides a safe, a safe place for, for people to just totally let down their guard and be who they are. And then, you know, at the camp, we find out that everyone that shows up there is a good person. Whether anyone else are ever told you that you know the good person comes out as well as the good musician i think people find out that they're better than they thought they were because there's safety there and people find out wow i don't have to compete with the next guy i can just be who i am including all the mistakes and i think teachers and students find that out a lot the best part of it all i think besides getting to share this with students is us teachers that have been teaching there for 16 years we get to do it, you know, monthly. And so we grow a lot 
and and we learn from our students as well as our guest instructors. So it's a it's a, just a wonderful place to be to be and a wonderful thing to be a part of. And just as we start to kind of wrap up here as well, if there's one record and one book that you could suggest to our listeners that they should check out, um, either it could be obviously that the book could be about music. It doesn't have to be though. It could be about some of the other things that you were kind of pulling upon. You were talking about there. What would that record in that book be? Yeah, you know, I I, I don't have one because everybody's different. And I don't know that there's one record or one book that would work for everyone. The thing that I like to do as a teacher is I like to find out a little bit about the person, about the student, and then recommend it from there. You know, one of my favorite bass players is Stanley Clark. He's always been my hero growing up. But if I get a student that's, a, that's, in, the, that's in really into bluegrass, I wouldn't recommend Stanley Clark to him. Missy Rain. You know, I'd, I'd go towards Roy Husky Jr. or, or you know, or, or someone like that. Or, you know, different different players like that that may relate to that person. And then eventually we would expand outside of that, you know. So it's hard for me to find one. Even as a person, you know, someone might say, well, the Bible. Then you would say, well, which Bible are we talking about? You know, what if this person is a different religion? Are you going to recommend that? You know, I, I, you know, my main thing is that you can find truth and beauty in anything, whether it's a flower, uh, any book, or anything. So, you know, I'd, I'd like to find out about the person. I mean, I, I can name a lot of great records, good musical records of all kinds of different styles. You know, from jazz to fusion to R and B to listening to Motown or listening to the Beatles or James Brown. There's great music all around, and there's always something to learn. So so instead of uh, recommending one thing, I would say listen to everything. Listen to as much as possible. The world is huge. The world is big. And now with the Internet, we have access to it all. So why just choose one? I say listen to it all, and that's the way you're going to help. That's what's going to help you to find who you are. By listening to it all, you'll find something that makes your heart sing. And then you lean towards that, but you don't exclude all the other stuff. Because we want to grow. We want to grow past just our preferences. So in choosing one, I'm going to go to opposite. And I'm going to say, listen to everything. So final question. Let's imagine if you woke up tomorrow morning and had to start from scratch. So you have obviously your base, you have your the skills and the knowledge that you've acquired over these years in music, but you have no contacts, you, you know no one. What would you do? How would you restart things? To to restart my musical career? Yeah, to restart your musical career. And the reason I ask this question is because a lot of our listeners who are maybe at that stage in their life where they're 17, 18, wanting to embark on this on this journey as, as a as a professional player and and I, i'm i'm sometimes a little bit concerned that they they look at artists they admire and they think to set off from where that person set off 20 years ago or 30 years ago where maybe things were very different so the reason i ask the question now is knowing what you know now how would you begin that journey sure uh, well, that that is a broad question, and I would go my parents' route, and um, for me, I would reevaluate what I think about myself. Uh, our parents taught us how to equate everything we do to how and, and see how it affects anyone else. In other words, let's say I want to be famous, but what does that do for the rest of the world, or does it just make me a lot of money? You know, so I would look at my motives, look at my reasoning, find out who I re reevaluate who I am and what do I have to offer the world. You know, because being famous, anybody can get famous. Just go try to rob a bank. You don't you don't even have to be successful. You'll become famous. Being famous is not enough. Uh, making it is easy. Just depends on what you call making it. But knowing who you are and becoming a value to the world, um, that's a lifetime journey. And I would start there, realizing who I am. What do I have to offer the world? If I just want to get my talent out there, there's no better way or easier way now with the Internet. 
You know, I can push a button and be in touch with countries and people I'll never visit or never meet. Nowadays, the Internet, YouTube, Facebook, that are that's your calling card. People are going there more than more than they're going to your website. You can make a video if it's good enough, if it's clever enough, and if it reaches people in the right way. You can make a video that will be that will go viral and people around the world will know it. I just urge you when you're going for that to make it something of value, not just something that's going to make you famous or benefit you. Make it something of value so that even if it touches one person, it really enhances that one person's life. But sometimes maybe even making a even beyond making a record, making a video that goes on YouTube might even be more popular. Because people aren't really buying records now, but they are watching whatever's on YouTube or, or Facebook. So make connections with people. Get out there and play live. That's your chance to touch people with your talent. Directly touch people with your talent. Get out there and play as much as possible live. If you're a musician, put a band together and, and become the hot shot band in your, in your local, uh, local town. You know? And then go from there, make a video uh, of your band, make a record if you can. But just really use the internet to its fullest to get yourself out there. And it can be done, and people are all people are doing it all the time now. And there are people with much less talent that know how to use the system to get themselves out there. You know, where a lot of us people with talent, we're practicing all the time. And we're not even developing people skills or internet skills or or, you know, public relations skills. And I say learn it all, get yourself out there, but have a good reason for getting yourself out there so that the world benefits. So that's a bunch of rambling. I don't even know what I said, but no, hopefully someone will get something from that. There's some wise words within there as well, Victor. And thank you so much for coming on the show. So share the best ways that listeners can connect with you, uh, can learn more about your, your camps, your recordings, what you're, what's, what you're working on. Sure, sure. Well, I'm on Facebook. Um, I have a, a Victor Wooten band page. You can text me there, message me there. Uh, if I get the an- if I get the message, I'll I'll, I'll answer it. Um, but you can also find me on on the web uh, at victorwooten.com, and that's v-i-c-t-o-r-w-o-o-t-e-n.com. From there, you can really find out everything else that I'm doing. But if you want to go directly to the camp page. It's Vix Camps, and that's V I X Camps, C A M P S. So, VixCamps.com. You can find out about our camps um, and all the scheduling. For anyone uh, that wants to get into my head as far as how I think about music, I urge you to find and read the book, The Music Lesson. The Music Lesson, a spiritual search for growth through music. You can also download it or buy it as an audio book where all the different characters and teachers in the book, they're all reading their own parts. Each character was patterned after a real person, Uh, even though the book is fiction. But I got uh, all those people to read their parts, and there's lots of music. So it's a fun thing to listen to. It's like listening to a movie. You know, so between the website, Facebook, you can find out where my concerts are, uh, and you can stay in touch with what I'm doing. Well, and we look forward to to also uh, reading the sequel to the book as yeah. well, when, whenever that that that's coming out. So, Victor, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, for being so kind with uh, giving your your time, uh, been fascinating interview, and uh, I look forward to reading that sequel and to catching you live soon. I appreciate. It. Thanks for speaking with me. Hey, James Taylor here again. And if you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.